Another important aspect of judgment is being able to select and solve the right problem. A number of years ago, a little town in southern Illinois had a nice new junior high school, a two-story school that they were very proud of. It was a rather long, narrow structure, a long structure, two classrooms wide. Unfortunately, after a year or so, it began to crack up rather badly and was beginning to tear itself apart. The school board was about to give a contract for underpinning the building. But before they committed themselves to this expensive operation, they decided to have one more look at the problem. They asked the University of Illinois if somebody could come and help them. At that time, the head of the department, Professor Huntington, was well known as an expert in building construction. He said, yes, he would come, and he'd bring me to look after the underpinning side of the question. When we looked at the building, we noticed some rather interesting things. It was cracked up indeed, but there were no cracks in the first story. All the cracks were in the second story. There were hardly any cracks near the center of the building. They were all concentrated out near the ends of the building. Couldn't have been a foundation failure because nothing had happened to the first story. Much more likely, and certainly the cause of the problem here, was thermal effects on the roof, which was reinforced concrete. As the roof expanded and contracted in this long building, it pushed the end walls out and pulled them back. It pushed the columns between the windows to and fro and developed cracks. Of course, it didn't crack near the middle of the building because there the total movements were small. It was in the center of things. So the problem that was being looked at and the problem for which people would have spent a lot of money was the wrong problem. The problem was in the roof, not in the foundation. The engineer who recommended underpinning somehow had missed that point. He was solving the wrong problem. Another similar example, a little more complicated perhaps, occurred in connection with a vertical lift bridge for a railroad in the city of Cleveland. The bridge was being built for the railroad by another agency, and the railroad was, quite understandably, uh, being quite sure that it got a good job. A vertical lift bridge consists of a span that is raised like an elevator between two tall towers. And when a ship comes down the river, the lift span is raised, the ship goes under it, and then the span comes back down again. The railroad was very concerned about the settlements of the foundation. They were concerned because they felt that if the foundations tilted, then the span would change and the lift span itself might not be long enough, or worse still, if the pan span shortened, if the towers tilted toward each other, the span might get stuck somewhere. So the criterion was set up that the foundation settlements differentially couldn't exceed three quarters of an inch. There were some 300 feet of clay beneath the structure, and the only foundations for which one could make a settlement calculation that indicated less than three quarters of an inch settlement would be deep piers extending all the way to rock. But at that time, piers to rock at that depth were unprecedented. It would have been expensive and perhaps a risky operation. Friction pile foundations would have indicated a settlement of perhaps about an inch, which didn't seem to be all that much more than three quarters of an inch. But matters were at an impasse, and there was a meeting between all the parties concerned. At the meeting, fortunately, was invited a consulting engineer whose whole lifetime, practically, had been involved in the design and supervision of erection and maintenance of vertical lift spans. And when he listened to the discussion and was asked for his opinion, he smiled quite broadly. He said, you know, we always allow about three inches play at each end of our lift spans. We can't erect a tower that's vertical. When we're erecting a steel tower and the sun comes up in the east and goes around to the south and then goes to the west, the tower twists around and it moves. We have to make allowances for that. 
at three quarters of an inch is, is much too rigid a criterion. Again, the wrong problem was being looked at. A solution would have been devised that produced a very expensive foundation that would have had really nothing to do with the critical thing, the movements of the tower. A third aspect of judgment is the ability to establish reasonable criteria. Sometimes the unreasonableness comes about because of different disciplines involved in the same problem. A number of years ago, the telephone company was extending its microwave system across the country with a series of microwave towers. From each tower, there was an antenna that broadcast signals to the next one where it was picked up and amplified and passed on. The telephone company set some criteria for tilt of the towers. Again, three quarters of an inch across the width of the towers. It seemed reasonable, but sometimes it was very difficult to achieve this criterion where the soil conditions were difficult. The spacing of the towers and their location was pretty carefully defined because of other constraints such as mountains in the way, buildings in the way, uh, minimum distances and so on, so that the settlement criterion quite often came to be a ruling one. As we began to discuss this matter with the electronics people who had worked on the wave guidance system, finally the top man came into the picture. And he said, I don't know where that criterion came from. We spread our signal over a much bigger area than the tower occupies. If the tower moved a foot or so, we'd still pick up the signal. There wouldn't be a loss. It wouldn't be a serious matter. This immediately, of course, simplified the design of the foundations and saved a lot of money. But somebody somewhere along the line originally had set an unrealistic criterion, and from then on, matters became difficult and expensive for that reason. What then are the bases for engineering judgment? What is the judgment founded on? There are probably two important ones. One is empiricism or precedent. What has worked in the past? A good engineer knows what has worked in the past. He also knows what has not worked in the past. That means he must be familiar with the history of his field of engineering. Empiricism saves people from making many mistakes. But of course, if we design things only in accordance with what had been done in the past, we wouldn't make any progress. So we have to go beyond precedent sometimes in designing our structures, our foundations, our engineering works. And empiricism can't be pu pushed too far in that direction. For example, back in the early part of the century, the spans of suspension bridges were increasing almost year by year. They went from 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet to 2,500 feet, and eventually, of course, up to 4,200 feet. The Builders, the designers of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had a span that was within the realm of experience. They did not realize that there was another factor that entered into the stability of a suspension bridge besides the span. That was the ratio of the span to the depth of its stiffening girder. Although the span of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was 2,800 feet, only two-thirds that of the Golden Gate. Its ratio of span to depth was about twice that of the Golden Gate, or for that matter, of any other suspension bridge. So following precedent with respect only to span led to the disaster that you all know about. The bridge tore itself down in a windstorm.